Get rid of your credit card debt, get a lower monthly payment, and skip your next two house payments at SaveWithConrad.com. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender. You don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to save thousands with SaveWithConrad.com. Find out how much money you can save right now at SaveWithConrad.com. Words are about to be spoken here on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, presented to you by the podcast Eden Ad Free Shows Networks. So I, of course, am John Apple, joined as I am by the <clears throat> broken one, woken one, spoken one himself. All Mr. of the Oaken Hardy. Yes, all the Okens and Opens and all that. Mr. Matt Hardy, what's up, man? Good to see you. I saw you a lot this week. It's great to see you again. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, it has. It's been a very busy week. The, the last couple of months have been very busy in general, but also it was a very busy week last week for the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy podcast because we took our act on the road, right, John? We did take our act on the road. Last week, you didn't get an update from us because we had the pre-taped Good Brothers episode from StarCast Air, but Matt and I hit Kowloon, and then we had an unexpected live show, too, at MCW Fan Jam after Renee Paquette had to pull out Uh, Thankfully, it sounds like she's doing well, so we're glad to hear that. But, man, what a fun week on the road we had first. We were up in Boston at Kowloon. An amazing time, man. How did the event go as far as you're concerned? Uh, It it was fantastic. Uh, This is truly the first ever solo. It it was only built and based around the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy podcast show that we've had, that we've done live. And uh, super pumped with the attendance so many people showed up. They were so passionate, and the feedback was uh, was off the charts. It was great. People seemed to have a good time. It was really, really fun to sit there and talk shop with you, and we were joined by some great guests, and Daniel Garcia, and my own man, Brother Zay, along with uh, the world's strongest man, Mark Henry. So a good time was had by all. Plus, I also got my uh, got my taste of uh, Kowloon oh, as well. So good. Food was absolutely amazing. The one thing I kept hearing from everybody, Matt, was how gracious you were with your time because we sold a ton of VIP tickets and those VIPs, they weren't shortcut, my friend. You gave them a good two, three minutes a piece, if not even more than that in some circumstances where you really chatted it up with people. I can see that in your meeting greets. You really do enjoy getting to actually have somewhat of a conversation with the people who pay their hard-earned money to meet you. I mean, I do. That, that, that is something that is very, very important to me. Because if I was a wrestling fan of, say, I, I got to go to uh, a Macho Man Randy Savage meet and greet. As I'm a young fan who loves pro wrestling. And, and if he spent time with me, if he gave me a moment, if he gave me an experience, and, and he felt like we were engaging in great conversation, then that, that's a moment I would treasure forever. And I've always thought that. So I always try and, I always try and live up to that standard whenever I do meet and greets. And I, everybody was really cool, man. And usually it's just a laid back, chill time. Two people, two human beings, just kind of shooting the shit, talking to one another, talking to one another, talking about pro wrestling, talking about memories. Uh, it's the best, man. It's not only something I do like as an occupation or job. It's something I do because I enjoy. I love doing that as well. I love meeting the people that have supported me for so so long. My favorite story from this past week was at MCW, where there was a couple who they had gone on a date before and they thought it went well. So they decided to watch WrestleMania 33 together. And what happened, Matt Hardy, when the Hardy boys came out? Uh, they, they found out that they're soulmates. Uh, the Hardy boys came <laughs> out. They, 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 they both had the same level of excitement. And they said, it's obvious. We're meant for each other. We are soulmates. We have found our, uh, we have found our partner for life. What an amazing story. How cool is that? Yeah, super cool. And love- God- Gothic baby was at the MCW fan jam as well. Yeah, She's more than Gothic- half assed over, bro. Way more than half assed over. Yeah, man. Gothic baby. She was there. She was having a great time. Oh my god, she was she was so hype on these airplanes. She loved traveling on airplanes. Much much more uh, 
unruly than King Maxwell was. He was doing all the traveling when he was young because there was only one kid and we were able to take him everywhere. Uh, but she, she, she had a blast on the flight, man. She hated being contained by that seatbelt on there. She wanted to run up and down the plane like a maniac. She had a great time, though, and it, and it was so much fun to have her with us on the road. Great seeing Queen Rebecca. She joined us on stage as well to promote her book, Life of the Gothic Baby, which you can go pre-order right now. Uh, it is available. Just search Life of a Gothic Baby and you will see that. We got a lot of our pals here, the top guys and top gals. We got Heather in here. We got Ken in here. We got your boy, yes. Coach, Coach Rosie, who says he hopes to see you at StarCast, Matt. What Josh, up, Josh? Josh Fields says, I'm so jealous. It looked like an awesome show. He's talking about Kowloon. I'm going to meet Matt one day. You will meet Matt one day. 100%, Josh. Josh yes. It's, it's going to happen. We got a great crew here. Ad-free shows. If you're a top guy, you get the perk of being able to tune in to these recordings live. It was such a fun time. And I'll tell you what, Matt. I got so many DMs that were like, when are you bringing the Extreme Life to my city? And I think that's something we're going to have to really do some serious thinking into. I, I am. I'm here for it, man. Uh, it sounds great. I mean, I, I, I love traveling. I love talking. Uh, I love telling stories. I love uh, debating uh, pro wrestling. There's so much about it to debate, you know, as we're going to do today, obviously, and uh, and coincidentally. But I, I, I really enjoy doing this and I enjoy meeting you know, my fans, my supporters and just people in general. So, yeah, man, it's, it's definitely something I look forward to doing down the road. So if you want the extreme life of Matt Hardy to come to the stage in your neck of the woods, shoot us those DMs. Let us know. Shoot us those tweets, those Zeeks, as Zeeks, Zeets, X's, whatever the hell they're called now. <laughs> Are they Zeets? I think they're called Zeets now. Zeets. Okay. Zeets, like John Zena. Yeah, exactly. John Zena. What up, Zena? You got to start Zabit. Zena Sr. came to our live show at Kowloon. Yeah, Zena, Zena Sr. did. It was very cool to see him there. Uh, we got Bobby in here. Says the extreme life of Matt Hardy in Oklahoma City would be one. You like Oklahoma City? Uh, yeah. I Oklahoma City, you know, uh, one of my biggest bumps ever happened. One of your biggest bumps ever. Yeah, the mm -hmm. leg drop off the cage. That was the leg drop off the cage in in, a, in yeah. Oklahoma City. Interesting. Okay. Well, we're going to be talking about the leg drop off the cage in a few weeks, I believe, actually, when we talk about SummerSlam 2005. So I'm very excited uh, for that one. We got Joe in here. Says, I hate that I'm late again. Don't worry. We just started, Joe. We just started. Oh, yeah, Joe. Joe, you're not late. You're, you're perfectly yeah. on time. Yeah. Zoel in here, Mr. Lopez says, need to come to Kansas City for some of that good barbecue. Oh, boy. You know I'm here for that. Oh, yeah. I am here for the barbecue. Good. Put over our friends at Jimmy's Famous because I know you got a chance to stop over there this week. Yeah, we did, man. Oh, well, I'm going to put over a few people first uh, First and foremost here. First, I want to put over uh, our friend Andy from Kowloon's. Andy, thank you so much for taking yes. great care of us and for uh, reaching out to me and setting up this event. I know you and John put a lot of work into it. And, you know, got everything together and it was such a great time and we hope to do it again soon. Come back to Boston, have another Extreme Life of Matt Hardy live show. Uh, I want to thank Dan McDevitt, who uh, allowed us to do the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy, MCW, and also uh, set up a great meet and greet for myself and Jeff. We signed for four and a half hours straight. It was That's amazing. Awesome. Uh, so, so good to see, you know. Well, I, I like that thing you tweeted, John. What did you say? The Hardys once again. <laughs> the Hardys. The classic Hardys on the island of irrelevance. <laughs> yeah, there you go, yeah. They just they they both signed two thousand autographs each. They're damn so irrelevant. Uh, it, it was great, man. It was so great to, to to have that show of support and that show of love. And then I also want to thank uh, I, I want to thank John from Jimmy Seafood, man. Uh, once again, we were able to go out. We were able to grab some food before going to the airport, which was I, I love to see it. And even uh, Queen Rebecca, who knows about Jimmy, she's been there before, but she was so happy with her food as well. So great yeah. stuff, man. If you're leaving mama happy, then you, you win some bonus points. That's not an easy thing to do. It, please, it, it please is not easy. That, 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 that is of the highest difficulty to keep her happy. <laughs> I can promise you. Speaking from experience, I can tell you, <laughs> it's it, it a challenge. <laughs> I wrote a card for Gothic Baby. I gave her a little belated birthday card, and I signed it. The second biggest piece of shit in the world. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Not, I the, not the biggest, the second biggest piece of yeah. shit. In the world. It was so much fun, man. I had such a great time with you. I know you got to spend some time with the family. You got to see the Barbie movie, right? Yeah, yeah, we did. We went uh, we went and checked that out. Uh, obviously, Rebby and 
uh, Evie were going to go just to have a girl's day, and it was great content for her. And I know she was excited to see it anyway. She was somewhat of a Barbie fan growing up, and I had no idea what to expect, but I was very pleasantly surprised with the movie. Gothic Enjoyed. Barbie, if you will. It was yeah. great. Yeah, to yeah. See, great to see them get in the spirit for that. Bobby wants to know, is there any chance top guys and gals could get to have breakfast at a Waffle House with Matt Hardy? Hmm. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm here for it. I love the Waffle House. I'm all about it, man. Give me the scrambled eggs and the uh, and the grilled chicken. I'll eat it all day, man. Throw some hash browns on there. I'll, eat, I'll even splurge and have some of them as well. I love it, Bobby. Yeah, you know, the the eggs element to that, I don't know about. But I can get down with the chicken for sure. I can get down with some good potatoes, too. Made some Wagyu, smoked Wagyu burgers yesterday. Life's, life's good, man. Life is good. It's the summer, and we're having a good time here. Uh, there was one thing I did want to ask you about, by the way. Saw this headline this morning. Yeah. Samoa Joe, your boy, who you've put over quite a bit on this podcast in the past. I love uh, Samoa Joe. Love Samoa gonna, Joe. He's going to be playing King Shark. He's voicing King Shark in an upcoming Suicide Squad video game. Mm -hmm. And he was asked for his picks for a Suicide Squad in the wrestling world. And he said, quote, very easy for me to put together. So firstly... I would be on there myself just because if I'm going to commit these guys to have bombs put in their heads, I'd have the common decency to put one in mine and be out there with them. What a noble gentleman Samoa Joe is. I definitely have the Hardys with me. They're unpredictable brothers. You never know what they're going to do. Jeff is always on some weird thing. I'm pretty sure he's a superpower. He just hasn't figured it out yet. They'd definitely be in there. Iron Sheik, if he was around, God rest his soul. I need somebody to be on the microphone on the loudspeaker blasting talking trash. I'd have Sheiky Baby doing that for them. I think with that crew, you can take over a continent. So we got Samoa Joe, Matt and Jeff Hardy, and Sheiky Baby as a suicide squad. What do you think about that? I, I, I like this melting pot of, of insanity. <laughs> I'm here for it. Yeah, well, yeah that, that, that's very cool, man. Uh, Samoa Joe, a guy I've known now for, God, I first met him in 2005 ish, I, I want to say. And uh, I, I've known him pretty well now for 10 years or so and uh, got lots of love for, for Samoa, for Jamoa. Still, still doing a lot of great work, too. He is. Yeah, he really is. Him and Dalton Castle tore it up. I was at the Ring of Honor show last week. Uh, hypothetically speaking, Matt, what would the Iron Sheik sound like talking some trash to some bad guys? No, I, I put them in the camel clutch. I break their back and make them fucking humble. <laughs> and then they'd say, I love you, baby, at the end. <laughs> yes, I break their back and then I tell you, I love you, baby. <laughs> hey, that's cool, man. Good company for you to be in there. Uh, no doubt about that. This, this really was such a great week uh, for wrestling. Dynamite, Blood and Guts did a big number. Uh, what do you think of Blood and Guts? I I, uh, I enjoyed it. You know, it, it, it's it's one of those things. It's a match. I like the fact that we do it about once a year. That that way it stays special. It kind of <clears throat> helps to make it an attraction. I think it's a match that you can't overdo. But I dig the fact they do it once a year. And I, I thought they had a – it was a great blow off to the uh, Blackpool Combat Club and the, the Golden Elite. So I, I, I'm here for it. And I love the fact that Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, they – released a press statement saying that uh, it did 2.5 million eyeballs or however you said it was stated in that specific way. But the fact that, you know, it, it had some sort of reach probably with DVR plus threes, we'll probably get some plus sevens uh, anytime now. <clears throat> but the fact that, you know, 2.5 million people overall watch that, whether it was on TV live, whether it was streaming, whether it was on DVR, whatever it is, that's, that's a great number. Yeah, it, it certainly was. I think, and we're going to talk about this over the course of this episode, I think Warner has quite a bit yeah. of vested interest in AEW, despite what some may seem to think, as we'll get into that conversation and the topic at hand, because I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation at hand here on this particular episode of The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. But before we can even get into that, Matt Hardy, you know what I got to ask you. Please hit us with that Matt fact. Matt fact, Matt doesn't speak until he has the facts. Well, I feel like you've always got the facts because you got the Matt facts. You're right. I mean, and that is a Matt fact. Matt doesn't speak until he has the facts. I think we talked about that just, just recently, too. There, there's a lot of that going on now where, you know, social media, it's something that is very tempting to people. And, it, and it's easy to kind of get yourself 
in trouble on there if you, if you don't really stop and kind of think about what you're doing. There's a lot of times somebody will just pick up something that's thrown out there, then they'll take it and run with it. Just, uh, just kind of sit back and wait. Let's wait until we know the facts before we officially comment on things. A life lesson from Matt Hardy. I don't necessarily disagree with that. I've been guilty of that in the past. I think all of us have been guilty of that in yeah. some point in life where we've Jump the gun on something, so wait and see. Let it play out, you may even say. Which, yeah. of course, you can pick up a Let It Play Out t-shirt over at boxagimmicks.com and just search Matt Hardy. It's summer outside. You're grilling, you're smoking, whatever you're doing. You're by the pool. Wouldn't you want a great Extreme Life of Matt Hardy t-shirt on your body? And show you. Look exactly. at me. I got, I got mine right here today. Matt Fact, Matt Fiction. I love it. This is I your favorite one. Right? Yes. This is your favorite that, one. That is my favorite. For sure. I love the font. I like the idea. I think it's a good fit for everyone. Go check that out. Boxgimmicks.com. I'm also, also a big fan of uh, Let It Play Out, too, because that is just such a great expression. And there's a lot of times in life you just really need to let things play out. Yeah. I had and some. Time, you absolutely need to let things play out sometimes. I had some requests for a uh, bad a, a, a t shirt. The. Uh, the uh, uh, raw. Bad. Wrong, bad, the wrong bad. Yeah, a wrong bad T-shirt. Just two, just two words. Wrong exclamation point. Bad exclamation point. I think yeah. we could get a T-shirt out of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, we, might, I'll we might get you. put like a zombie on there. You know, like with his jaw, like a brainless zombie uh, with his jaw. Ooh. Wrong bad. You know, it's like <laughs> a. <laughs> I love that. Bobby says, "Dynamite Rampage and Collision are must see TV, but we need more Rebel and Matt Hardy on." My TV, he says. All right. I love it, Robbie. Thank you. We like Rebel. I, I'm a Rebel fan. I concur, yeah. I uh, I also, during the course of this episode, to all the top guys and top gals out there, please make sure to interject and throw in your thoughts on all this because we, we want to bounce ideas off you too. And we really yes. uh, we really did that. Yes. So we're going to need your com comments in conversation for this episode because, Matt, I – saw an article this past week on the internet and it caused a lot of discourse in wrestling twitter or x or whatever the hell this platform is uh crazy a right? lot of wrestling discourse yes a lot of zeets a lot of zeets were thrown out there and it was an article by eric beeston called four reasons why wwe is hotter than it was during the attitude era and this threw everyone in a frenzy okay and he he gave four reasons. He said the masters of the spectacle, young celebrity and the cool factor, the prodigal son returns and other emotional stories investment, of course, referring to your boy Cody, and Roman raids. High tides raise all ships, he says. And I think it's a conversation to have about WWE, but of course about wrestling in general and whether or not we are truly in a wrestling boom period or if we're not in a wrestling boom period if we're on the verge of a wrestling boom period i think you're the perfect person to ask about this because you were active when wrestling was arguably at its most popular and you're still currently active today and can compare and contrast mm -hmm. and i think uh, we're gonna have a really cool conversation here so your initial reaction when you hear the notion that wwe is hotter than ever Okay, I'm going to answer that question right here, but I want to interject real quick because you just brought up Cody, and I do have a lot of love for Cody. Uh, it's so funny. You know the quick video you took? You said, like, Gothic Baby, where you guys were all yeah. close. Mm -hmm. You are all excited. She waved. When you said Cody, yeah, it reminded me so much. Maxwell was doing the stuff at Impact as King Maxwell, and there was a point where I did a Northeast Wrestling show with Cody. It's the first time I'd seen him in a while. We had a great conversation. And there was a point where Maxwell was by him, and he picked him up, and I saw him sneak a picture. I was like, hey, just take a picture. He said, well, you know, I just kind of want to document it. It was with King Maxwell. And uh, he said, I probably won't post it because that would be creepy. He said, I don't want to do that, but I did want to take a picture with the king. But it was very much the same thing, like – it's this little baby that's got a lot of buzz around him and people are talking about him and Cody took a picture. It, it, your little video with Gothic Baby reminded me of much the same. Oh, I was I was posting that shit. No, I was like, I need that cloud baby. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. I feel you. I was like, I, I need someone to get me over in Gothic Babies. The amount of DMs I got off that on Instagram. I'm like, oh, I, I, I know her. I know her from TikTok. <laughs> I've seen her. I was like, yeah, her, that baby. Uh, but yeah, okay. So you remember that with Cody and Max. So that's great. I know you're a big Cody guy. And we'll talk a lot about Cody on this because Cody, sure, yeah. you can't deny Cody is a big part of this conversation as Absolutely. is. 
Um, by the way, we got Lindsay who's in here. You just got a chance to meet Lindsay, top gal Lindsay yeah. at MCW this past week. Oh, Lindsay, it was what a what a pleasure it was to meet you. I'm so glad, uh, so glad we got to run into each other. That was that was fabulous. It was so fantastic. you know, when 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 you talk about that uh, during the attitude era uh in the late nineties, obviously, uh in compared to now, the early twenty twenties, first half of the twenty twenties, wrestling is really, really good now beyond a shadow of a doubt. It's just, I think it's very different the way you judge the parameters of the entire wrestling industry. I think if you look back to the Attitude Era, it was more ingrained in pop culture. I think that people in America, you might I could even say North America, were much more aware of pro wrestling and it was like cool, it was trendy, uh, but it was, it was very different. Now it is so much larger on a global scale and Sure, we got huge, huge numbers where 7 million, 8 million, 9 million people, however many people would watch wrestling, you know, on any given Monday night back then. But it was very different. I mean, there was only 40 television channels then or whatever, you know, is much, much smaller uh, as far as like the things you could watch and, and, and your choices. But if you fast forward 25 years later, you know, now you have thousands of channels just on cable. You have uh, all these streaming services, Netflix. Hulu, whatever it may be. There's so much content out there. Now wrestling is also uh, taken in and absorbed in such a different way. It was cons It's consumed now in so many different forms. Like some people watch it on live TV. A lot of people just only solely watch it on DVR. A lot of people stream it on whatever their device is. So there are many different ways to watch it. And I think right now, compared to then, it isn't as ingrained in pop culture as it was in the late 90s, but it's also much more well-received and much more known about and people are aware of pro wrestling currently around the globe because so many people you know sit here and they look on their devices and this is where they watch their pro wrestling they watch wrestlemania here they watch all out here you know they watch all their events right here on their smart device so then let me ask you to take a stance on this and we'll revisit it at the end of the episode after we have our discourse here is wrestling hotter now than ever yes or no I don't think wrestling is hotter now than it was in the late 90s. But I do think wrestling has a much more sprawling uh, impact around the globe. And, and I think it has the chance and ability to become hotter now than it was back then. I think that's where we're at right now. I think many more people consume pro wrestling in this day and age in so many different ways. And you can't keep those numbers. But back then, it was just a little bit hotter at that time because it was truly a part of pop culture. And that is something that is really hard to do. Now it's much more of a, of a niche, you know, industry as, as most everything is. There's so many things out there. There's, there's so much entertainment to choose from and everything is almost niche and has like a very certain audience. That's why I am a huge advocate of saying we have to appeal to like more casual fans. I think casual fans are the way to grow pro wrestling in the big scheme of things. I mean, the people that are wrestling fans, they're going to tune in and they're going to watch wrestling because they love it. And they can complain, they can bitch, they can moan, but they're gonna they're gonna tune in, and they're gonna watch it because they love pro wrestling and they have to get their fix, so to say. But I think we need to continue to try and build people that are uh, crossover stars that appeal to the casual audience, and especially speaking about AEW, WWE. Obviously, they're taking some great steps in the way they're doing the thing with Logan Paul, the way they're doing the stuff with Bad Bunny, because that does cross over and they have, get casual fans to tune in. And I think they have a real successful formula going on currently. Couldn't you argue, though, that the diehard hardcore fan <laughs> is the one that has fueled <clears throat> pro wrestling right now to be the most lucrative that it's ever been? Like, yes. I think that's a big part of it. I don't think they're the sole proprietor of that. But I do think the fact that we have such an impassioned, hardcore wrestling audience that's willing to pay money for wrestling content, that has been extremely important for growth and for economic prosperity here. It, 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 it absolutely does, John. And you are correct in that assessment. I, I, I fully support that. And also, I want to add on top of that, so many people are consuming pro wrestling right now and paying for pro wrestling in different ways. And we're in a, a pretty tough economy right now, too. We have to keep that in mind. In the, in the late 90s, we had a great economy. There was much more money to go around to spend on entertainment and wrestling and, and pay-per-views and whatnot. Now, not quite as much because times are tougher. I think that's something that almost has to be factored. Well, and right now, I mean, you do look at the economy right now. 
the one thing that hasn't been affected, even though we, we've been dealing with inflation is and this is the reason why we haven't gone into a recession is because people are still willing to spend money and, and people are spending at a high rate, an extremely high rate. They're willing to pay the high ticket price for an event. They're willing to go to that extra length if they need to for their disposable income, because for whatever reason, it's worth it for them. And people, I mean, look at, we're on ad free shows right now, right? We got right. our top guys and top gals. They are spending a hundred dollars a month on just this sector of pro wrestling content. I'm sure some of them go to indie events. Some of them go to live events. Some of them are buying t-shirts. Some of them are going to meet and greets. So the hundred dollars a month, that alone is just going towards this one portion of pro wrestling content, Matt. I mean, hundred percent. I mean, and two, I think we've got to the point where you learn if you have something that you really enjoy, it, it is worth it. You know, if for me to go out and have a great meal, it is worth spending extra money because it is something I enjoy and it, it is something I, I, I really want to partake in. And I think that goes, that's the case here. I mean, the Podfather has set up this amazing service where you get to hear behind the scenes stuff. You get to hear special insight from wrestling. You get to hear these amazing conversations like the one hopefully we're having today. And, uh, and I think these people enjoy it and it's worth their, their money, you know? And I think the diehard pro wrestling fans that follow pro wrestling, obviously feel like it is worth their money to invest in an AAW or WWE or an impact or whatever it is they may invest in. But I think too, to continue to grow that audience, you have to appeal to people outside of your specific bubble or your, the, the, the specific parameters that you constantly deal with at all times. You have to, you have to bring other people into those parameters to make them expand and get bigger. I mean, even Bobby says here, don't forget about wrestling corn album. Of course, what you could go check out wrestling corn album.com, but that's the point. People will pay for me. I'm a scrub and people will pay for, to, to listen to me talk about pro wrestling. And that just shows you that there's this taste. There's this appetite to consume this type of content here. And I mean, Josh even says, I've got no shame admitting that I watch some kind of wrestling seven days a week across several different promotions, both mainstream and indie. And I think <laughs> Josh says, but you're and, asking, and, and, yes. and Josh, Josh and, and you're right. If, if I wasn't wrestling, if I wasn't uh, the father of the gaggle, if I wasn't traveling nonstop, I would too. I would be watching wrestling every, every day because at the, at the end of the day, I am a huge wrestling fan. I've just, I've been able to luck. Uh, I was lucky enough to, you know, chase my dreams and actually catch them. But I, I'm here for it. I love wrestling as well. And I'd be doing the exact same, Josh. And yeah, there's no question. Back in the 90s, viewership was exponentially higher. But there are outliers, as you alluded to. There are much fewer channels at the time. DVR does not exist at the time. So the only way to watch something back is if you were able to tape it and you were lucky enough to actually be able to see it, which I'd, I'd get a big pop to see. You throw a, a VHS and a VCR at a younger kid today and see if they knew what to do with it. I think it'd be pretty right. interesting to see. It get, try that out with Maxwell and Wolfie and all them. See, do you guys know what this is? Bro, I, I we just a while back, we had to go over to my dad's. My my brother and I, we were specifically looking for something. And uh, they, they, went, they went with us. <clears throat> and we went over there. We have a lot of stuff packed up and stored and whatnot, right? So we're in there, and there was actually these v – there's a big counter of VHS tapes and a VCR there. And, and they're going like, what is this, Dad? What is are – these aren't books, are they? You know, they're just not just – what, what do you do with them? I said, well, you put them in here, and this is like how you watch stuff. We used to do that. And he said, they're so big, <laughs> which popped me huge. And even what popped me more than that was when they said, what is this? And it was a rotary phone that was on the wall, you know, where you don't – and they said that's a bone uh, you know? <laughs> because all, all, all they know are small little smart yeah. devices but that was your way of having to consume it so it, it was must see tv wrestling right now and this is an argument against it being hotter wrestling is not must see tv you can have something really great that you want to watch but you have the ability to watch it a few hours later or watch it the next day you have that luxury and that's not just exclusive to wrestling that's to a lot of things right where you have the ability if you want to watch it another time you can where then there was this idea that if you were not involved in the moment in seeing something as it happened 
you could then not be part of that discourse the next day around the water cooler. Right. And, and, and it was like that during the attitude era, you know, that, that's well, one thing that I can definitely say is that once we got the opportunity to be utilized and we got somewhat of a push and then we got into winning the tag titles and then the tag team ladder match at no mercy nine, nine, the TLC stuff, like, we couldn't go anywhere without getting recognized because that's how popular it was in pop culture. And I remember how crazy it was that whatever store we walked in, whether it was, you know, the strip at Myrtle beach, you know, or Belk or JC Penney's or even Walmart, there were Hardy boy shirts in there, which is crazy. It's crazy to think about now, but like wrestling was so mainstream and it was so accepted and popular at that time. But once again, you have to look, at just how society has changed, how everything, especially entertainment, is so much more niche than it's ever been. And, and people spend their dollars in different things. Now, there's so many more choices, so many more options. But the fact that wrestling is doing as well as it does right now, every single week, Dynamite last week, the number one television show on cable for the night, it's always in the top five to ten, uh, with, without a doubt. Collision is doing great for being a brand new show. Uh, even... Rampage does really well for that 10 p.m. time slot at the at the end of the day, you know, and WDB, they're doing some of the, you know, some of the best ratings they've done in, in quite a while, especially on SmackDown. And I think that's powered by the bloodline. You have a great cast of characters. You have a great story. And, and I still think that is something, a huge element of wrestling that we should lean more into. I think the most important thing, the most paramount thing in pro wrestling isn't necessarily the quality of the match. I think it is the quality of the story and the journeys these characters are going on. I think that's the most important thing in pro wrestling, in my and that, opinion. And that that's is, my and that's something that we can talk further about and contrast of then versus now. But I mean, you talked about like Hardy shirts being at Walmart and stuff. The funniest thing about that is right now, I feel like wrestling is even stronger with its licensing of intellectual property when it comes to having deals with Walmart, AEW's got the championship belts out at Walmart. WWE has fantastic toy licensing in every major store out there and department store and, you know, thing, entities like Walmart. It's everywhere. And I think that back then you just said that it was so ingrained in culture, which is interesting because... The WWE product now, the AEW product too, but especially the WWE product is far more socially acceptable and socially mediated than it was back then. So why is it not as pop culture relevant as it was in the 90s? Uh, just, I mean, it's just not a priority in pop culture as much as it was then. Sure, is it accepted? There's just... But why do you think that is? Because there's not a, a story that has really captured everyone's attention. You know, you go back, the NWO, that was a huge kickoff for capturing everyone's attention. Everybody was talking about the next day of the water cooler. Stone Cold Steve Austin, Vince McMahon turning heel. Uh, that, that was a huge story that captured everyone's attention. And, like, people couldn't stop talking about it. And now there's not something that has been able to – penetrate pop culture that has been able to do that in the last 20 years or whatever you know there's n never been anything that has reached that level into current american pop culture but also there's a lot more things out there now you have i don't you have soundcloud artists you have yeah i mean you have so many different genres you have so many different niche things of entertainment it is hard to break through would matt hardy have been a soundcloud artist had that been around back in the day i feel like 18, well, there's 19. a lot of that, you, you, that could be true, but there's a lot of damn Matt Hardy and Jeff Hardy and Hardy Boys SoundCloud songs out there. That I know for sure. Um, but I think there's one part of that that you're not hitting, and that is that the 90s, the mid to late 90s specifically, there was a huge rise in counterculture within pop culture. Mm -hmm. MTV, you can argue MTV was at its hottest in the late 80s, early 90s, but nothing was stronger in terms of MTV content than the late 90s in reflecting where society was at that moment. The celebrity death match, you know, the, you had the tail end of Beavis and Butthead, that kind of stuff. 
pro wrestling adopted itself into counterculture. Uh, yeah. Look at the stories that we saw in the Attitude <laughs> Era. <laughs> Uh, or as Eric well, Bischoff, it, 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 it was the, ri the rise of the anti-hero too. The rise of the anti-hero for sure, but you know, people loved the women in clad clothing. They loved yeah. choppy choppy pee pee. They loved all of the and for as bad as they were, and they were horrible. Some of these stories, they really were they reflected society you know we just saw the headbangers this past weekend you and i right yeah the headbangers today with that gimmick i don't know if that really works but back then and they were far from the most over tag team in that division but were they not an embedded reflection of a portion of society at that point i mm -hmm. uh, no, yeah I, and I, I do i do agree with that but man those were great days. I missed the nineties. It was such a <laughs> you're nostalgic for them. I get that. And that's that's wrestling fans too. So many wrestling fans are nostalgic for that. Uh, you would go in, and this was a part of the conversation that I had to argue with with some people online because I, I feel like some people do lack context for this. Right now, WWE and AEW too are doing some of the highest gates ever in wrestling because WWE has gotten attendance up. And in the process of getting attendance up, people are, because of inflation and people's willingness to pay, as I was just talking about, people are willing to pay large amounts of money to go to these events. So you have higher gates and you're doing like 12, 13,000 fans at some of these Monday Night Ross and Friday Night Smackdown tapings. But Matt, and I'd love for you to attest to this and give us some perspective here. I was saying, because I've done research for every episode of this podcast, there were times back then where Saturday WWE would run the Meadowlands and you would do right. 18 and a half thousand people for a house show. Sunday, you would run MSG. You would do 18 and a half thousand people for a house show. Monday, you would run the Coliseum and you'd do 15,000 fans there. That is not happening today. Right. Correct. Uh, I mean, we would, we would do 10 nights on, four nights off, and all 10 nights would be sold out. It didn't make a difference if it was Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. Every night would be sold out, you know. And that that was here primarily in America. Even we were lucky because when we first started on the road, like there was a time how business was down in the early '90s, and they did a lot more international stuff because they had to go overseas because business was weaker here in the U.S. We didn't even have to leave the U.S. because it was so white hot, and every night was sold out regardless of where it was. You know, it, it would be. 10,000 people, 13,000, 18,500, as you said, 19,000, 17,000, 14,000. Every night would be a sellout wherever we went. It's crazy how insanely hot it was. And it's there. not just that they were sellouts. This was my bigger point. The buildings were set up for 17, 18,000 every night, and they were selling that out. Now, WWE will do 13,000 for a Monday Night Raw, and they'll sell that out. And that's awesome. There's no, and again, it'll do a bigger gate than what it did in the 90s because of how the economy has adjusted appropriately. And, and, and we're seeing those stats, right? I, I see, maybe this is uh, SRS that reports this, is like internal information says this was the biggest gate they've ever had in Richmond Arena, in whatever arena. I mean, I see that a lot nowadays, like it is TVs when I'm scrolling through social media. Yeah. And that'll be with 6,000 less fans than what you would have gotten on a Monday Night Raw taping in 1999. But that's because... Right prices have changed for that yes, but, but the arenas are set up differently where the, the point i was trying to make if you go to a wwe house show right now it'll probably be set up for like six seven thousand fans on, on in a good in a good town maybe a little less and they'll pack it and they'll sell it out and that's awesome but what i was just trying to get across is back in 1999 2000 2001 you would go to Wichita, Kansas, and put 16,000 people in a building on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong by that? No, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, every, every venue would be filled to capacity. They would have to open up seats, like with, you know, uh, they'd say, oh, well, th this view is a little obstructed, but we're going to open up these seats if you guys want them, and we'd sell them to. You know, everything would be sold out. And that's not necessarily taking away, and I want to make that very clear. I am not taking away from the accomplishments of WWE 
right now in doing that. It's amazing because two years ago, 2021, five years ago, four years ago, WWE was not doing that. They were booking 15, 16,000 seat arenas and they were doing five, 6,000 people. That's how they were doing that. That's not the case anymore. And AEW is, is doing strong gates. I don't think the attendance numbers have been super huge this year for AEW. I think they've been a little down overall, but the gates are still strong. The pay-per-view gates are still strong. And AEW is about to do 75,000 plus for Wembley. Right. That's That's yeah. got to feel a little reflect. I mean, how do, you, how do you feel? I'd like your honest thoughts on that. The running I mean, that, the venues that's... and then having them set up for smaller crowds. I mean, I, I think that's fine. I, I think it's very realistic. Uh, one of my favorite things to say is like unrealistic expectations will always result in disappointment. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they have very real, realistic expectations. They know there's uh, X amount of people that are going to go. If there's it's a 12,000 seat venue and they know their statistics and, and their demos in that area, they know we can definitely sell 8,000 tickets here. Let's just set up for 8,000. And then if that sells early on, then they can open it up and they can sell more tickets. You know, so I, I think that's smart. I, I, I think that is very much being realistic about your product. And, what and you I know do. one way, Matt Hardy, that we can get some last minute tickets if you're trying to score them for any wrestling shows. And that is with our pals over at Game Time. Matt Hardy, what a segue that is, huh? That was a great segue, indeed. Uh, you can, if the capacity is 8,000, you can uh, get that Game Time. You might get ticket number 7998 and 7999. There you go. What do you love about game time? Uh, I just love how convenient it is. I love how easy it is. And I love how there's no hidden fees. Oh, the best part. The all-in pricing lets you see yeah. that there are no hidden fees. You know exactly what you're going to be paying for. Yes, you're going to be paying a lot for tickets these days. That's just how it happens. But you'll know exactly what you're paying. You talked about how easy it is. Here's how you can do it. Download the game time app. And you enter in that promo code Hardy, and you're going to get $20 off your first purchase. $20 goes a long way, Matt Hardy. $20 might get you some Jimmy's Famous Seafood Crab Cakes. $20 might get you a couple of beverages at these shows. Why wouldn't you be saving that money with our pals over at Game Time? Buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful, even if you are a procrastinator like Matt and I. Well... With Game Time's flash deals and last minute tickets, it's easier than ever to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. With images of seat views provided right there on the app, so you know exactly what your view is going to look like. Make sure there's no obstructions. Make sure that it is as close as possible. You're not going to get screwed by anything unexpected because Game Time has got you covered. Forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event and buying tickets is never easier it's just going to take a matter of seconds two taps and you're set matt you know that i did this i told you about this i waited until the very last second to buy tickets for spring scene in philadelphia back in april literally 30 minutes before the event and i scored them i was a happy man you got anything coming up that you might want to try to score some tickets for i don't know i was gonna say if people having a jumped on all in they might be looking for a game time for all in late august Ooh, well you use that promo code hardy you're gonna get twenty dollars off download the game time app create an account use code hardy get twenty dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account redeem code hardy for twenty dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed hey guys double j jeff jarrett need to call a timeout real quick here i wanted to tell your listeners what i've been telling my world listeners for a while now it's about all the incredible things happening over on adfreeshows.com the debut of tuesday with the taskmaster is here exclusively on adfree shows kevin sullivan shares stories of his 50 plus years in the business including the night the business changed forever the night he turned heel he stayed at my house his agent came. I had a three-bedroom house at the time on the beach, and I wouldn't let the agent have a room. I gave Hulk a room, and we didn't leave till the first match was in the ring. We got in his limo and drove down. I was so afraid someone was going to change change his mind, and I've heard a lot of things that 
It might have been Sting. It might have been Big V. I didn't have a second choice. It would have to be Hulk. On a new edition of The False Finish, Conrad is joined by none other than Glacier as he breaks down how the Glacier character came to be and the memorable vignettes leading up to his debut. I enjoyed doing the vignettes. Uh, I felt like it was um, a chance for me to show off that martial arts side uh, that I I'd had, you know, and it was something I was very passionate about. And now, yeah, my two loves of pro wrestling and martial arts were being combined together. So, so I was all in. Hey, that's just a small taste of what Ad Free Shows has waiting for you, including a brand new perk, getting to join in on the live recordings of the shows with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. That's right. Sign up today at adfreeshows.com. And when you're talking, Matt, about these live events too i do think you need to discuss the indies because there's an argument to be made that the indies right now are hotter than ever as well and that is fueling the success of the top promotions you've been doing indies for years especially (laughs) major portion of the last decade how do indie events today compare to when you got back on them 2011 2012 well, I I still think it's kind of the opposite. I think if the top promotions are doing well, I think it feeds down and helps the indies. Uh, sure. I think it's it, it, it's different now because indies have different outlets and, and ways to promote their events that they didn't have have 20 years ago. But I definitely think if wrestling is hotter in general, it helps the indies more than anything else because people just want to consume wrestling. But I and also even think if that the indies are, are supplying talent for those major promotions at a rate that has never been seen before. No, I mean, they definitely are because it's, once again, almost like a territory effect. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a great, hugely beneficial reason to support the indies because there's going to be guys who are – there's no expression they say in the wrestling business too. You're only as good as the person you're able to work with. Like once you get so good on the indies, you need to work with someone who's like been around for a while and like knows the business inside and out to actually improve and get better. That was the case with myself and Jeff whenever we first started coming around WWE. And then once we finally got hired at WWE to, to work there, you know, you're only as good as like the best person in the room, the best person you're able to work with. But now there's a lot of guys who are able to go back and do indies and they can help elevate and teach other guys things. And AEW in, in some ways is a great example of that because like that's something I'm allowed to do as well because I get to work with younger guys and I get to teach them things that they probably wouldn't learn from somewhere else from, from doing television wrestling or from a a way to react to a certain angle or the way to take your time doing something as opposed to rushing. So the Indies are doing good. And I I think the Indies are benefiting hugely just from social media and, and different ways of promoting yourself. You're able to like put together a, a, a GCW video that goes viral which is magnificent for GCW because now it like puts eyeballs on that product, which is something no one had access to 25 years ago. So that's a game changer for sure. And I didn't mean that pun, but it is a game changer. Uh, And and one thing I think is that whenever the top promotions and right now that's WWE and AEW, whenever they're doing well, it it trickles down to the indie from fans, from, from, from fans wanting to attend more wrestling. Sure. Well, so have you noticed a change in indie shows since from, like I said, when you started working them 2010, 2011 versus now? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the good ones are a lot more solid in this day and age, and they're also more well attended. So they are more well attended. Mm-hmm. I agree with what Josh said here. The talent level in wrestling right now is higher than it's ever been. That's across the board. I very much I, agree with that well. notion. I, uh, I dub that as a mad fact. As mad fact, not mad fiction. Uh, Lopez brings up Sky Blue, says she's a great example. This shows up on AW and still works the indies as well. And I feel like with AW too, that's kind of important because there are only so many reps you're getting without doing house shows. So having the ability right. to work indies, I, I feel like that is beneficial to some capacity. Well, th- this is something else I want to throw in there. If you took the quality of wrestling now and you compared it to the stuff that was on Raw and Nitro in the 90s, it, it, it's better now. 
I mean, back then it was more ingrained in pop culture, as I've said before. And it was like, there were stories that were hot that like casual people really connected and like latched onto, you know, whether it be the, the rise of Stone Cold Steve Austin or the, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan turn Hill and the NWO, whatever it may be. But like, if like those botchamanias and, and these people that are just like, love to be negative and hate on wrestling were around back then. Oh my God, they would have had a field day because there were so, so many things that just went awry back in the day, especially on live television. Yeah. You've been around a few of those folks uh, over the course of the years, for sure. The talent level is significantly higher and it's from people who were inspired by individuals from that time period. I think there is one. So, okay. One pushback I'm going to have on the hotter than ever conversation. They mentioned that Cody and Roman Reigns play big roles in that, right? Why, why do you think right. Cody and Roman Reigns play a big role in that conversation, Matt? Like, why do you think this individual and other people who have supported this argument looked at Cody Rhodes and Roman as examples for why the product is hotter? Well, I think they're, I think they're great examples of why the product is hotter. First and foremost, Cody, it was a big deal for him being one of the founders of AEW, one of the guys who helped start that company, one of the guys that really kicked it off, and, and, and one of the hottest acts in pro wrestling altogether at that time. And considering he was one of the forefathers of AEW, the fact that he jumped back to WWE and it was a big deal, it, it was very important. And, and those are things that are good for business because it's something that fans love. It's something that they get off on. I, I know I did back in the day. If someone jumped from NWA or WCW to, to WWE and vice versa, that was always a big deal. And then Roman Reigns, on the other hand, finally they decided to turn him heel. They they pulled the trigger. They went all out with it, and and it's worked out great. And their storyline with the bloodline and him being the longest reigning champion in a very very long time, over a thousand days right now. Uh, their their storyline has been extremely compelling. It's something that's hard to turn away from. And, and that is something that you can tell the numbers don't lie. Like every time they have a bloodline segment, viewership goes up every single time. It's a draw. But there's a point that I'm making with these two individuals that I think actually supports the antithesis. That being Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes are big time top act stars right now. We agree on that, right? Yes. They are big time top act stars. WWE and pro wrestling as a whole have had so few of those since the Attitude Era. Whereas you look at the Attitude Era, the Monday Night War era, there were multiple top mega star guys who each carried equity and almost equal equity among them that helped propel the product into a higher standing. What do I mean by that? I'll give you this example. This is, in my opinion, the very best example of how much true star power WWE had back then. The Armageddon 2000 main event. Six man hell in a cell. Rikishi's kind of the outlier. They were trying to make him one, right? But it, it didn't work out. You had, aside from Rikishi, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Triple H, The Undertaker, Kurt Angle in there, and The Rock. Those five guys, Matt Hardy, are mm -hmm. five guys who are company carriers, top-level draws, and each of them, maybe aside from Kurt, but I'd still even give Kurt this too. They supersede the brand that they were working for. Wrestling has not had that in a long time, aside from really John Cena. Whereas Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns feel like they're on the cusp of breaking that. What do you think of that assessment? Yes, I agree with that. I, I, I think Roman has, I think he has broke through. I think he is that special of a performer right now. And I think the thing that can break Cody through is him finishing the story and finally winning the title at some point. Matt, I think stories are never finished in WWE. Didn't you hear? Triple H said that. There's, stories are never finished. We're just you in the third to, inning, pal. You don't have to get hot, John. 
the, the, the fact <laughs> is, what, the, the, the culmination of him having a successful journey and getting to that point and the realization of him winning the world title that his father couldn't will be the point where that that particular story finishes and another one will start. Uh, but but that is a deal that will be I feel like that'll be the thing that will be the culmination of Cody's superstardom. I, I think that is a deal that is going to help him turn the corner and be be a much, much bigger deal. I I mean, I have gone on the record and said this. Cody especially, is, especially if he defeats Roman Reigns. Cody is the closest thing they've had to John Cena. Mm-hmm. He is that and people have looked at me with two heads. But you just said, mm-hmm, and you agree with that. Why do you agree with that? I, I mean, he, he is. I mean, the, the the one thing that makes him so special and so unique is the fact that he left WWE on his own accord and he wanted to go out and prove himself and 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 get out of the you know, get out of the spot he was viewed in. He was stuck in where they saw him at WWE, and he did that successfully. Uh, there's the infamous story now about him taking up the the belt uh, the bet with Meltzer about selling 10,000 tickets to an event, and that's where the original All In happened. And then that eventually led to the formation of AEW with Cody, the Bucks, and Kenny Omega. Uh, and, and then he, you know, was a, a true pillar a true pillar, a, a true cornerstone of AAW, someone that was one of the forefathers of AAW and had that vision for it. And then he was there. He made AAW successful along with the help from all the other cast at AAW. And then, like, he ended up leaving AAW to come back to WWE with, like, all this extra added equity. And then he has the story, like, my father never officially won the title, and now it is my mission it is my journey to get to that destination of becoming the world heavyweight champion to, to, to live out his dream. And that will finish the story that will finish my story. And people are emotionally invested in that. I mean, he, he raised his value so much from leaving WWE, not being afraid to go outside of Alexandria, do his own thing, build himself into a, a new person, a new mold of a different kind of performer and which he did the American nightmare. He went to AEW. He turned that into a success. <clears throat> Left, went to WWE, and became one of the biggest baby faces in all of pro wrestling, all of pro wrestling history. And he's still in the midst of, of making that journey to getting back and, and finishing his story, winning the World Heavyweight title. And for the record, I don't blame anyone else for not reaching that level because I think it has been directly in correlation to the company's refusal to let anyone become bigger than the brand right i think wwe's priority since probably the pg era began 2008 specifically is that we are the brand we create stars but no one supersedes that and i don't necessarily think that they view that from a vindictive standpoint i think that's just how the company operates and now you see two guys in roman reigns and cody who you can argue are in the process of becoming bigger than the brand. And that's what you had back in 1999 and 2000. Yeah. I mean, I think some of that too, becoming bigger than the brand was something they were a little nervous about in some ways, because you had, you know, the Hulk Hogan, you had the stone cold because at some point guys can guys gain so much power. If they become bigger than the brand that they can kind of direct the brand and direct what they're doing. And that's something I feel like, especially Vince specifically, that's something he kind of veered away from a little bit, you know? So he wanted to build up equity in the name of WWE, the company that has all these great performers. And, and, and I think I'll go on the record and say this too. I, I think now the most important thing you can do to have a successful company is, is build up your brand and, and, and your name, and you want WWE or you want AEW, whatever it may be, to say that we have this amazing household of performers within our company. And if you watch the show, it's going to be great every single episode. That is very important. And I think that's what sells more than anything now. But there are those guys, whenever they rise bigger than the brands, it's great to have them on your roster because you know they're going to be more or less household names at the end of the day. That's something that Vince kind of strayed away from because he wanted to make sure that all the focus never went to just a immortal Hulk Hogan or all the focus went to a Stone Cold Steve Austin or all the focus went to a rock that all the focus went to WWE, those three letters, as opposed to one specific performer. But then isn't it ironic that he leaned on John Cena for so long? Uh, I mean, 
not really. I mean, when you see it, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just understand Vince, Vince, Vince knows he, he knows who to roll with. He, he understand how all, all, all those go, all those things go, but he's very protective about his company and he's always trying to protect his brand. Josh says if they stick the landing, Roman's inevitable face redemption story could be one of the biggest ever. Oh, oh my God. It's going to be massive. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Josh. I, I, I mean, I said this here on the podcast when you did the thing with Braun Strowman. I said if they'd done a double turn and t- turn Roman Hill, I, I knew he could end up being successful, especially with how the audience views wrestling now. I said, and that's going to ultimately lead to him being the biggest baby face ever when it's all said and done. Yeah, I agree entirely with that. Now, you're talking about star creation. Could AEW ever create a star of that magnitude that crosses over into the mainstream realm AEW as a company has done an amazing job so far in its first four years of existence but needless to say it does not have the standing and merit and long-term fruition with television partners and mainstream wrestling audiences that WWE does just because WWE has been around for ever can yes. AEW in your opinion how can they if so create somebody that is at the level of a Roman Reigns or a Cody Rhodes right now? I mean, you, you have to remember, too, AEW is still in its infantile stages. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's something that can't be stated enough. And and don't forget about it. AEW has done so well. People like to forget that. And they go, oh, my God, WWE is blowing AEW out of the water. I mean, it is still brand new. Four, four years old. I mean, it really still is in its infantile stages. I mean, and AEW is just kind of figuring out who it is and we're really kind of like laying these parameters and guidelines about what we need to do and and we're still figuring out things as we go but it, at the end of the day aw is going to continue to grow i have no doubt about that uh whenever we do our next television thing i think it's going to be way bigger than this one because aw has has proven it. there's a lot of equity in it i mean the first thing i can point to is you look at all out on august 27th you know we're north of seventy five thousand tickets sold so I mean that's that's quite the quite the accomplishment considering we've never been out of North America yet, you know. Just the, the first show has got over seventy five thousand tickets sold that we're going to internationally. So AEW is growing and it's getting there, and just whether it happens by coincidence or whether it's done on purpose, someone is eventually going to click and they're be- going to become that, you know, mainstream star. They're going to become that 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 special star that stands up, which is like almost uh, teetering on becoming bigger than the brand. That will happen at some point. Is there anyone on the roster right now that you could see accomplishing that? You know, the the, the, the one name I always like to go to was, uh, was Wardlow back in the day. I, I think he's got a lot of tools. I think he's got a great mentality. You know, once again, it's just kind of getting him in the right scenario. I feel like, once again, I'll stress this over and over, just getting a character into – the right scenario where there's a story and, and you get become invested in this character and you want to see their journey. You want them to see it through and you want them to finish their story and find success. You know, we just got to get somebody in that role. And, and a lot of times it's a timing issue. Could MJF be in that role? Possibly so. Uh, I, I still big, uh, big advocate of, uh, better than you, baby, you know, with what they're doing right now. And uh, as you said, too, I, I hope they continue to roll with that. It's something that happened organically. It, it didn't feel forced. It didn't feel pushed down anyone's throat. And people really enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here for it. Also, I'm going to throw in, too, man, I, our boy DG there, man, that uh, little dance him and Sammy did had me popping huge, man. When he s- slid through Sammy's legs and popped his head through and had that crazy expression on his face. If he's a sports entertainer, then I am too. Yeah, Shibata. I asked Shibata about Daniel Garcia at the Ring of Honor show, and he he says that he thinks he's the future of wrestling, and he says he's not a bad sports entertainer either, which I thought was pretty cool coming from Shibata. Lopez yeah. thinks Britt Baker has to be up there in that conversation if there's someone today that could cross over and, and break through. Yeah. So Yeah, that's love me some Britt Baker, man. I know you do. And – you talked about Wardlow, man. I think one of the things about Wardlow, right? He just, he looks like a movie star, right? Yes. I think he looks look- cool. He's got an incredible attitude. He's extremely athletic. He's got an awesome physique. I mean, he's like a guy who can, you know, he, he, he could be one of those guys that could do it all. And he could also have a crossover appeal to people outside of pro wrestling, I think. 
I'd imagine one of the reasons, Matt Hardy, that he's got that physique is, of course, with our friends over at AG1. Yeah, you knew that was coming, folks. AG1 has got you hooked up, whether you look like me or whether you look like Wardlow. All you got to do, one scoop and a cup of water every single day to get that all-encompassing nutritional insurance. Matt Hardy. Tell us how AG1 fits into your daily routine. It's the first thing I do every single day. When I woke up this morning after uh, a long night of delayed flights, I didn't get quite the the eight to feel great, the eight hours of sleep I would have loved to have gotten. But I got that six and a half. And when I woke up and I had my AG1, uh, I drank those AG1 and I, I feel like I got that eight hours of sleep. That's how great I felt. AG1 replaces your multivitamin, probiotic, and more in one simple drinkable habit. It's science-driven formation formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients will help you feel good every single day. We're talking about 75 high-quality vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients that are so convenient for you, Matt. You're going to be traveling to London for all in. I know you're not a fan of lugging all those multivitamins overseas with you. Stage one, keep that convenient for you. I mean, I, I'll be I'll be having it, and everybody else is on that trip. You know, we'll be there chanting, let's drink AG1s. Let's drink <laughs> AG1s. Let's drink AG1s. You know, man, that, that, that stuff, it'll keep you revitalized. It'll keep you fresh. It'll keep your eyes open, and it'll keep you ready to go and ready to perform at All In in London. AG1 is not only a high quality all in one solution for daily foundational nutrition, it also saves you time, confusion, and money. Each serving costs you less than $3 a day. You had quite an assortment of beverages waiting for you at your hotel this week, Matt Hardy. AG1 is cheaper than all that. It is. It is cheaper and much more healthy. That it is. We want to help you out here. The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health try ag1 and how many free ag1 travel packs are people going to begin matt hardy uh you're going to get five cinco five cinco five free travel packs and a free one year supply of vitamin d with your first purchase go to drinkag1.com forward slash hardy that's drinkag1.com forward slash hardy check it out and we thank ag1 for sponsoring the extreme life of matt hardy we love ag1s in this house one of my favorite things, Matt, from our live show at Kowloon this past week was when I asked you, because we did a watch along of right. the tag team ladder match, the inaugural tag team ladder match. And I asked you, how many stars would you give it? And the entire room did the five, cinco, five, cinco, five with you. Yeah. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. Yeah, that I was cool. I popped huge for that. We're over, pal. This thing's, it's this a, thing's we're, working we're, out. Five, cinco, five, cinco, five. Half ass over, dude. <laughs> Rosie got cooked right How would mid 2000s TNA have done in this era today? That's interesting. Um, I, I think it would have done better than it, than it did then because I feel like uh, a higher work rate and mm. better in-ring action is much more appreciated in this day and age. There's one question from Rosie, too, that I'm going to get to here that I think is the most central part of this conversation and a lot of wrestlers and executives wouldn't be willing to talk about this stuff but i've got a feeling you might be willing to yes how is wrestler pay in comparison to the eras now my argument matt right now is that wrestling is more lucrative than ever across the board not just for the wrestlers but for executives obviously as well and the way that wrestling makes money has changed a lot in the process. So give us a little bit of perspective here of pay then versus pay now. Um, it, it, it has changed a lot. Back when we first signed, we had things called downside guarantees, which you'd be guaranteed X amount of dollars, which uh, usually the if you were on the full roster, if you were on uh, full time on the, the main roster, most guys started at 75 grand. And usually it was like, it upped a little bit every single year, but 75 grand is what you were guaranteed to make. And that's even if you got hurt and you were out all year long. Right. You know, but then if you worked more house shows, you worked more live events, you were on TV, you got hot, you're in a big angle, you're on pay-per-views, then you can multiply that downside guarantee many times over, obviously. So in 2000, our downside guarantee was $75,000 and I made 14 times that. 
So, I mean, we, 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 we did okay, you know, d during that time. And, and now we're in an era apparently from WWE, just like whatever you end up signing, they might still try and call it the downside guarantee, but it's more or less going to be like a salary. And I feel like that that's more or less what things are now. What you end up signing for is like what your salary ends up being. But and the salary is higher than most of those downside guarantees, correct? Absolutely, it is. And 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 some of the guys I know that are working WWE now are getting pretty good deals. And especially there was that that window when, you know, Triple H slid in and was in charge. You know, whatever when he slid into the DMs and was kind of running the show there at WWE. And and I know some of the deals that he you know, signed guys too were, were, were pretty good. You know, I think Vince kind of realized when he was the only game in town is like, this is kind of what I'm going to offer you and you can take it or you can leave it, you know, but just having another game in town with AW, it's helped out everything, you know, especially from the wrestlers having some ability to make more money in a certain place, because in theory they could go to the other place. So that, that's been a good thing. And it, AW, I have a salary and I'm super happy with it. You know, uh, I'm taking great care of here. So I, I have no complaints. The money has changed once again for the better now that there are two companies out there. Once it was only WB, there was times where it was harder to get a bigger payday and to earn more, even if you were truly worth it, because they could kind of do whatever they were going to do. You know, they could kind of give you whatever they wanted to give you because there was no other ball game in town. There was nowhere else you could go. But now with AW being there, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing for the talent. And Rosie follows. He says – no pay-per-view payoffs like the old days or do you still get pay-per-view bonuses uh, no pay no pay-per-view paydays i think i think they're gone uh you know the wwe I, i'm not sure what system they do now considering they're doing uh ple's right premium live events is what they call the their their ppvs now they're paid talk yeah right 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 but that um, has changed it like the 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 ott and streaming has changed pay structure too yeah, I'm, I'm sure it has. I'm sure it has. You know, but here here at AW, it's it's pretty much for the guys that are full time that just have like a salary deal. It's just a salary, and you're not really bonus for stuff. But I would like to add too, with Tony Khan, he allows you to step outside of the AW Alexandria, and you can go do cons and other shows and indies and whatever else. So that allows guys to make so much more money. And in reality, probably the the the, the last couple of years are two of the biggest years of uh, two of the biggest money making years I've ever had because I've been allowed to do outside stuff on the outside too. Can you give us some perspective? Because this does play into the conversation at hand. You just said that that's really important for making money. You don't have to give us a very specific number, but can you give us a range typically of what you might walk away with from a convention, someone of your equity uh, on, on a given weekend? Uh, well, if you see myself and Jeff there for four hours, it's going to be, 25 grand. I can tell you that it's a pretty, pretty flat rate of what we have, you know, 25 so, grand split between you two. Yeah. And then the, if there's extra stuff in there, then there's a, uh, you know, extra money. And, and that's 25 grand break this down for, cause I, I, there are going to be wrestling nerds listening to this. We're going to love this type of conversation. 25 grand. Is that just to get you there? And then you pocket what you make off the signings. How does that work? Well, I mean, that's it, too. If there's any promoters out there that are looking to book us. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Well, if you if you have spoke to anyone or agent or person, you know, what we typically do is for four hours, 25 grand. Uh, and then if there's extra stuff that's added in there, we do whatever. And that's just that's the pay. That's like our booking fee. That's what we charge. Uh, and then, you know, there there hasn't been an instant yet where someone hasn't more than made their money back from us going somewhere. So, but know, so, so let me I'm, I'm, I'm asking for the structure here. So. 25 grand booking fee then mm -hmm. the fans will pay 150 dollars for a combo they'll pay 100 dollars for whatever that money goes to the promoter correct yes okay so unless, I'm asking, okay. In, unless there's extras in there unless there's extras in there they want to do if they want us to sign like extra items for some people that could be money that could possibly come to us you know if, they, if there was extra eight by tens they want to sign to sell on their online shop or whatever it may be you know sometimes there's extra things that are included but basically if we're going to go to a place and we're going to sit down for four hours and sign that's like our going rate currently and that, that's nothing that you know i'm not really even worried about disclosing that's just like our current booking fee no, I, I mean the, the reality of it mm -hmm. like 
and that's the business. There's no, I normally save this stuff for strictly business. My podcast with Eric Bischoff, but talking about the business of the business that puts into perspective, guys, twenty five thousand dollars to book them. That's not something that people would have been paying at conventions years ago. That's just something that tells you how healthy the industry is right now. Right. And and also too, still, I mean, it just, you know, Jeff, Jeff and I, we're, we're very lucky to have been on TV for so many years. We're very lucky. I was talking to my good friend, Scotty Tuhati, that I happened to run into yesterday and also this morning at the gym. Uh, you know, we're talking about how lucky we were to be on television during the Attitude Era because like people just still remember you so strong from that time there's never tv had never been more powerful when it comes to like uh absorbing wrestling content and like when a guy gets over on that television then they're remember they like live in infamy uh you know they they they, they're they're infamous they're infamous they live uh they're infinite when it comes to remembering those people in many many ways so we were just very blessed to be on during that time of the attitude era and like people still remember that like so many so many times i hear it every single signing we have like oh my god thank you for giving me a great childhood or you were my childhood you made my childhood awesome you know which always flattering to hear and it's super great but once again we're just very blessed to have had the run and be on television as much as we've been on television the, the reason that the money has changed so much is because the way money is made in the business has evolved tremendously where it used to be the live gate as you were just discussing and it was right. merchandise based now we see these guaranteed licensed television and media deals and streaming deals and licensing deals that are directly feeding money to these companies that are allowing them to guarantee money in these contracts. And if they're not guaranteeing money, it's at least being paid more upfront as like you alluded to a salary per se. In 2001, Matt Hardy, WWE's first year that they reported revenue as a publicly traded company, they reported $430 million as revenue, okay? And that's not necessarily what they're pocketing. You fast forward to this past year, 2022, $1.29 billion. And that has changed because of how the, the, the models have changed. Distribution has changed. More countries have access than ever to this. Much more global now than ever, much more global. And so, yeah, maybe domestically as many eyes aren't watching it as they were when you were out drawing Monday night football, but there are people now in every continent who have more access to this content that is very healthy for the industry. I mean, agree. Uh, you, everything you said there was Matt fact. And then also on top of that, Matt Hardy, there's the last element of this conversation I want to discuss. And that is the celebrities you brought up. Logan Paul and you brought up Bad Bunny before. I yeah. think celebrities right now, WWE has struck freaking gold with this, where they I, are finding celebrities who A, love pro wrestling, and B, or I'll say B and C, B, have massive reach with social mm -hmm. media, and C, they're really freaking good at it. And <laughs> That, I think, has been a major change that we've seen over the years. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I, especially Bad Bunny. Bad Bunny is such, such a huge star, you know, and, and just his, his reach to different audiences, especially Hispanics and Spanish people, you know, like, dude, uh, what a what a catch that was, you know, and especially considering he's a big fan. And he's also very athletic and he does great stuff, you know. He's huge. And Logan Paul, obviously, you can look at his – he's a social media influencer legitimately you know has so much stuff going on and he's incredible as well they really did they struck gold with those two guys what does having invested celebrities do for publicly expanding reach i mean it helps them grow you know especially to different segments of the audience that they might not catch their attention and that that's once again that's why i was saying i think it's very important that you find someone on your show that you get a character that like supersedes just the wrestling audience and really connects with a different segment or portion of the audience that isn't watching your product and gets new eyeballs on your product. Can you remember any interactions from over the years with a celebrity who we may not know really loved it and versus maybe a celebrity that didn't necessarily love it so much? I mean, yeah, there, there's been, there's been 
some of both. You know, there's been guys who have, who have come in that have been celebrities that couldn't give less than a shit about wrestling, and they were Can just there give for me one? Throw us What's one. That? We're coming after you. Throw us one. Oh, I mean, uh, William Shatner. You know, he's a really? good he's a, WWE Hall of Famer, William Shatner. You know, he, he came in and he was there to do his gig and do whatever. But at the end of the day, he's all right. Well, this is a good gig. It's just another acting gig, whatever. But as far as like being a fan of pro wrestling, I don't, I'm pretty sure it wasn't. Okay. William Shatner was not one. Who was someone that you met that was really into it? Let me think of someone that was a big fan that I can remember that was like a big deal. Oh my God, even going back and thinking about this, this is uh, very tough. I mean, one of the first persons I can think about that really enjoyed pro wrestling was uh, Jungle Boy Jack Perry's father. Luke Perry. Okay. Huge wrestling fan. I remember seeing Jack come around when he was a kid there. You know, once again, another one of those guys I have very fond memories of him as a little baby walking around like Barty or Wolfie, you know, and, and now he's at AEW and he's a big deal and I'm wrestling against him. How was know? Evander Holyfield? Uh, very, very he, he was cool. He was very professional and got the vibe of pro wrestling. You know, I had okay. that weird instance with him right. when uh, right. JBL stooged off that, the, you know, that, that story where he was kind of shit talking him a little bit, which got him mad, but he, he was great, man. And even through all that, he was very, very professional. Everything he did. But none of those people, nothing wrong with having your Pete Roses and your William Shatner's and all that, but, and your Kevin Fetter lines, but yeah. none of those people add the value that a person like Bad Bunny or Logan Paul, right? Not to. at all. I mean, and it's just such a different time now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to you have to look at the ways. You know, Bad Bunny is a, is a is a one of the biggest music artists on the globe. You know, so anyone who is a fan of his is going to follow him very loyally so they would follow him on these wb journeys so that means you're going to have new eyeballs on your product which is so important did you Logan meet Kevin Fetterman? uh i did i think it was just like a what's up or whatever right. i did, did, did yeah just said said hello a greeting main, event, main evented versus john cena did kevin Fetterman? how about that uh one more question here from Lindsay. a good one what about travel has that changed with who takes care of paying for it uh, well, I mean, that's one thing that's great about AEW. I mean, they, they take care of all the travel expenses. You know, they, they really do take care of the talent. Very good. In WWE now, it's still you book your hotels and you pay for them and you get your rental cars and whatnot. And you, you know, you kind of have to, you know, you have to flip that bill. Uh, and they say, oh, well, it's a good write-off for your taxes. But that is one thing that's great about AEW. They they really, Tony Khan does a great job of taking care of all his, all his performers in there. What about flights for WWE? They pay for the flights. WWE have pays they for, the flights. for your flights. They they have always paid for the flights. Even back in the day, I remember when they would come in, they'd have a stick sack of tickets this big, and they would give guys tickets, airplane tickets for a month. It was just such a different time then. Uh, but yeah, they they've always paid for flights. But when it comes to WWE, you have to you know flip the bill for your hotels, for your food, uh, for your rental car, whatever. And you know once you come out here for AW, they take care of your flights, they take care of your hotels, and uh, if you have a rental car that you got to get, they'll they'll reimburse you for that as well. And then they, then you steal Kane's first class ticket. Yeah, and you know it could have been you, John. I could have sold your first class seat as well. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Hold on. You're insinuating that I fly first class here. <laughs> I'm just insinuating that was when we went to wrestlers court. That was one of the uh, points. They said, mm -hmm. "Ladies and gentlemen of the court road, it could have been you. It could have been the Godfather. It could have been John Alba. It could have been Brian Knobs. It could have been this guy. It could have been that guy. The Hardys could have done it to you. If they do it to Kane, they do it to anybody." <laughs> could have been you. Yeah, that's what I'm just pushing back on. It couldn't have been me because of all the times I've flown, I fly a lot. I don't fly quite as much as you do, but I fly quite a bit. I've still in my life never flown first class. I don't have that that twenty five thousand dollar booking fee that you do. So, uh, <laughs> but but as Josh Fields says, I do enjoy my Wagyu beef. That ain't cheap, brother. You're right about that. No questions yeah. asked about that. So, Matt. This has been a great discussion, so now I want to bring it full circle and ask you firmly, after considering all these things, and I've, I've heard you over the course of this discussion, maybe lean a little more one way than I thought you were going to, is pro wrestling hotter now than it's ever been? I don't think pro wrestling, I think pro wrestling was hotter in the 90s overall, but I think we're at a point right now where it can supersede that if we continue to go in this direction we're going in. I think the the rivalry between WWE and AEW, I think the things both company or companies are doing, the way they're growing, I think we are able to reach a point in the future if things continue to 
trend upward if they take the same uh, the, the same upward projection. I think wrestling can become hotter than it was in the nineties. Love to hear. Do you feel like we're on the verge of a boom? I, I do. I, I feel like we 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 can get there as long as there's no kind of drastic tragedy that happens or anything. I think if things continue as is, we can get into one of the biggest wrestling booms of all time. Ever the optimist is Matt Hardy, and this has been a great conversation on the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. This is what you want to be subscribed for, guys. You go to extremefg.com, yeah. you get that subscription. You go to adfreeshows.com, you become like our top guys and top gals who joined us, like Josh. He says, love when you guys do this live. Appreciate you. We appreciate you. Thank Lindsay's this great you. episode. Thank, Thank you, you Lindsay. very much, Lindsay. We appreciate you guys. And we want you to be part of our team here at the Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. Head on over to advertisewithhardy.com to promote your business to the extreme. Get it in front of thousands of listeners and viewers every single week. That's advertisewithhardy.com. Matt, this has been really great. I know you are in Albany right now. You got some Jeff Jarrett Ballyhoo to deal with. Anything else you want to throw out there? Yes, I want to flip the script, and I want to ask you, John, is wrestling hotter now than it's ever been? I want your answer. I think wrestling is healthier now than it has ever been. I don't think hot is the right term to use because variables have changed exponentially from when wrestling was at its most viewed period domestically versus how it is now. But if I were to be asked... Is the industry in a better place than ever? Yes, I do believe pro wrestling is in a better place than ever where talent are making more money. Gates are higher than ever financially. There is so much more distribution than there's ever been. And most importantly, Matt, and we didn't even hit on this, but I'm sure you will agree on this and you've, you've mentioned it in passing on past episodes. Wrestling is a more inclusive space for talent of all kinds than it has ever been. It is not the Wild West like it used to be. It is a more welcoming environment for people of all shapes and sizes to be great and make money. Would you agree with that? Yes. That's a, a very solid statement. I would agree with it. And I think that is the most important thing when you're discussing whether or not the industry is in a good place right now. So a nice little wholesome way to end the extreme life of Matt Hardy. Anything else you would like to add to that? No, I'm great. I enjoyed this conversation. Very, very nice discourse. I agree with that entirely. The words have been spoken. We'll see you next week right here on The Extreme Life of Matt Hardy. Adios.